Thank you for having me. My name is David Farron. Um, I know that the TEDx Unionville High School team has put a lot of work and effort into this, and I thank you guys for all of your effort. Um, tonight I'll be talking about creativity and the pursuit of a good idea. When was the last time you had a good idea? I think that, that the spectrum of a good idea is very broad. It can be as small as taking a shower in the morning, I think that's a good idea. Or it can be big enough to impact countless people around the world. Either way, there is no good way, there's no, there's a lot of good ways to be creative. There is, um, there is no one way to be creative. We all have our own processes, we all have our own ways of coming up with those good, sometimes great ideas. So today, I'm going to focus on my, showing you my creative process, because it's something that I know and I've been working on for quite some time. Whether you're working individually as an artist or collectively, we are constantly pushing creativity in the pursuit of a good idea. The first step in creating any collection for me is the mood. This is where I kind of let loose with my creative side. I can start with uh, photography, I can start with paintings, I can start with poetry. It really is anything um, that I'm feeling. But really the purpose and the, what I end up refining to is asking questions like, does it create unconscious connections between themselves? So let's say this painting and there might be a song that I'm also referencing when I'm building a mood. Um, I think that it's really important for particularly clothing design that the, the mood invokes something um, with, whether it's color or silhouette with clothing. Um, you can see this image. Um, this is one that I'm actually using uh, for a current collection. And you can see that it actually, it referenced clothing and it's kind of in an emotional way without giving too many details. So I, I love this image because I can actually run with this as a really good starting mood for color. Um, I think it's also important that we pull from personal experience. Um, my friends and family know that I'm obsessed with Maine. Um, my great-grandparents bought a cottage there in 1963, and so this painting reminds me of the coast of Maine. Next, a big thing that I like to do is figure out who the garments are for. Um, as Addison was saying, I've had my design studio for three years, so really what I've been working with are women in this local community um, to design things for them. So I have to ask myself, who is actually wearing the clothes when I'm designing? This is one of my uh, favorite clients, my mother, Mrs. Farron. She's the art teacher at Patton Middle School. Um, when I was working in the fashion industry up in New York, there were a few things that I realized designers did um, to isolate their customers. And one of the simple things that I try to avoid is to isolate customers, because that eliminates showing the work. Um, one of the things they did in New York was limit the number of sizes they had in the store, which I just always found outrageous. Once you have a mood <laughs> defined and a customer in mind, you can start to build your seasonal color palette. Um, oftentimes, that the colors are going to be pulled from that mood board, but it is also an evolution of brand identity. So you'll see, um, you know, some, some designers are incredibly eclectic with a ton of colors and patterns. Others are more minimal and just kind of evolving in, in neutrals. Um, so really that's a brand decision. Um, and one thing that I'm always thinking about when I'm developing a color palette is whether the colors actually compete with each other. So this blouse, for example, which is one from my collection, um, I wouldn't necessarily offer a similar blue. This is more of an ocean color, you might not be able to see that, but in my eyes that's ocean, and I wouldn't offer a navy to compete with it. One really good example of a brand that is always evolving kind of a similar color palette and uh, fabric story is Chanel, and this is just a perfect example. They've had these types of tweeds in for decades and decades, and they reinvent them every single season from the top couture collections and all, all the way down to their ready to wear and their bag lines. Once you have an idea about what the mood is going to be and the fabric and color, um, that's when you get to what's called the croquis phase. And a croquis is a quick silhouette sketch of, of your design. Um, usually when I'm working in kind of a big sketchbook format, I like to include drapes, vintage references, and uh, images all kind of jumbled together in a collage, and then I come up with silhouettes. 
This is how I've been working recently, which is a little bit more precise. Um, these are what my croquis look like. They're very efficient. Um, I'm really kind of dissecting one concept through a bunch of sketches. Um, and anybody who is in the design world knows that this is where we live. We design these in our sleep. We spend days and weeks and months just doing these sketches. Um, but I've kind of started to uh, sketch into groups. So this group particularly, you can see is three similar silhouettes, but they're all different proportions. So when we get down further in the line and we're editing the collection, are they, this is going back to, are they competing with each other? Or are they informing each other? Oh, I wanted to show this because this was my very first croaky sketch back when I was in uh, Parsons. Uh, so you can kind of see how my taste level has evolved. Once you have your croquis and your general silhouettes, then you move on to technical uh, flats and tech, tech packs. Um, this is where you're really starting to bring that sketch to life. Um, there's a lot that goes into a technical flat. There's full teams of designers, and if you've been noticing, there's actually a few careers on some of these slides um, that if you're interested in fashion, but you might not be a you know, you might, might not be great at drawing, there's a lot of opportunity in these flats um, are given to pattern makers and factories to then try to make the actual garment. Then we have fittings. So once this technical information has been given to a factory and we get back a first sample or a muslin, uh, they're called, we do a fitting with the model. Um, this is where we start to dissect whether the pattern maker actually achieved the proportion or achieved the silhouette that we were going for. Um, and then does it really fit a real body? And are the lines that we drew in those croquis actually going to be flattering on a real person? So this is where it all kind of comes together. This is through, through all of my slides, there's so many different people working on one piece together. Once we have the finalized patterns and then we have first samples in the real fabric, so we've worked all the way from mood, now we have a sample. Um, then we go into press and sales. And this is when you start to show the work. So you have to kind of come up with a general aesthetic. Um, I like this kind of, these, this is an example of a piece from my, my studio. Um, I like, I've always wanted it to feel like you're stepping into an artist's painting studio, because it actually is, these, all these pictures are taken in my painting studio. Um, so you're asking where it's gonna be sold, is it gonna be online mainly or in person? Um, and then how press and magazines and things like that will be, will inform the collection and hopefully pr uh, push sales. When I was working for a designer named Bibu Malpatra, we did a lot of celebrity dressing because it was an evening wear kind of um, uh, red carpet collection. And uh, so these are three examples of really high profile placements um, like this particular one at the beginning with, with Michelle. I love how I have like first name basis. I've never met these women, they just happen to wear the clothes, so. Um, but Michelle Obama, she liked a piece from our runway that happened to be more of a plum color, and we re remade it for her um, in the ivory and black. Anything for you, Michelle. <laughs> so after uh, many years, I think the, a really good kind of contrast here is, you know, there's highs and lows in every industry. You know, obviously dressing Michelle Obama is a high. Um, but then I had a low in 2017 where I got fired from a senior design position. So that's when I actually started my own design studio. Um, I found a space here in Unionville, Pennsylvania, and I jumped on it. And instead of kind of thinking too much, I just wrote a business plan and got to work. And that's where I am now. So there's this constant, uh, constant theme in cre creation where you know, there's loss and recovery and kind of what comes from that. So for me, it was an amazing design studio that I'm able to center the whole community around. And I'm able to be around my family in a park, not like a dirty New York street <laughs> every single day, even though I don't mind that. Um, but it's, it's nice to, to be able to just kind of move with, with growth or loss. Um, and one really good example is, uh, you know, the first event that I had at the shop, I was working with a um, local jeweler named Alexis Kletchian, and we did a great event where we invited both of our client lists um, to a party where we showcased both of our work. 
The other great thing is I've been able to build a team. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to work as much together during the pandemic as I would like. Um, but this is Dakota. She's an amazing designer and my assistant, um, or my apprentice. Nancy is an amazing seamstress and she's been sewing gowns for me, which has just been such a, such a great, um, great thing to have. And then Shelby, who's a, a muse and just awesome woman who collects incredible vintage. So together, we all work together to make what my studio has come to today. This is an example of a dress that we all worked on um, at different points. So back before the pandemic, I was about to have another big life-changing event with a runway show at the Brand New Owned River Museum of Art. Um, that was scheduled for March 28th, 2020. Um, if anybody knows what happens around the 16th, the whole world changes. So on March 16th, I had to cancel that show, which was another devastating blow. It was just like emotional. Um, but what kind of came out of it was I started to talk to my designer friends and we needed to really figure out how to use our skills that we had built at fashion school and through a career. Um, so I started sewing masks for Chester County Hospital. So designers, we started to do our parts. We saw from Christian Siriano making masks all the way down to us making them for a hospital. So we really were um, all working towards that. And one of the things that I noticed when I was sewing masks for Chester County was that the construction was very difficult. It took me a long time to sew. So during that process, and it didn't fit properly, and it was uncomfortable, all the great things. So my kind of designer mind redeveloped and rethought the whole construction of that mask, creating the everywhere mask, which is what I have here. Um, my dad's a carpenter, so he was kind of my number one guinea pig for the mask as he was still working um, on construction sites and in other people's homes with the mask on, um, and he got dirty. And so really this, from you know going back to really thinking about um, personal experience and forming the creative process, this is a perfect example. Then I got a call from another hospital, so I'm in the, the mask world now. Um, but I got a, a call from Nemours Children's Hospital, and they called me to ask for any shop scraps that I happen to have to donate to their, um, their team of sewers to actually manufacture masks in the hospital. And because I just, um, I just found this fabric for the Everywhere mask, I said, you know, well, why don't we do a fundraiser and kind of think outside the box instead of just using my scraps, why don't we raise some money to get some, some, um, some yardage? And our goal was $1,500. We doubled that goal and ordered 270 yards of this neoprene antibacterial um, face mask material, which created, or had, I don't even think they ended up using all of it because they didn't need to, um, but had the potential of making 5,400 masks for the patients of Nemours Children's Hospital. So final thoughts. I mean, I think I threw a lot of different types of information out at you, but I think that's kind of what creativity and creation is. Um, but I think one of the big things that I've come to learn over the many years in design is that we are not a result of our accomplishments. We are often too consumed with the big ideas when the next runway show is or career move or the next big thing and that we actually miss the opportunity in the small day-to-day -day things that inform incredible design and incredible art. The best ideas don't come from an active search for them. I think you have to have an openness to allowing opportunity from the process. And results don't always come. You know, you can work really hard at something and fail. And the more failure I've had, the more I've realized that that's just the way life is. But that never really, you know, you can take your time to grieve the loss of what you thought was important to you, but ultimately it's about moving through all of that. And who we are is really the result of an active pursuit of creativity, happiness, and love. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.